Hoping everybody can hear me okay. Am I unmuted, Nicole? <laughs> yeah, you're good. There you go. Well, welcome today to another uh, online class with Sunnyside. Uh, today is drought tolerant. Uh, we're going to talk about a number of things as we go through the class and show you lots of plants as usual. I am uh, Trevor Cameron, our general manager here at Sunnyside. Uh, Nicole probably wants to say hi. She's in our office managing the chat. So hi, Nicole. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of as an introduction, I think um, these online classes have been interesting because I'm guessing we have a, a number of people from different parts of the country perhaps joining us. Uh, and we are in Western Washington, just to reiterate. So I am talking a lot about Western Washington plants and options that we can utilize. Um, certainly you may be able to use some in your area as well, but I would always contact your local nursery to ask for advice. Um, there may be some questions from different areas and we may be able to answer some, but uh, certainly your local nurseries will be able to help you a little bit more. So, um, you know, as far as our local climate, uh, being born and raised here, I think um, those who are joining us from Western Washington know full well, we have plenty of rain, you know, it keeps our state green. Uh, I love it, I wouldn't change it a bit, but it's a, an interesting gardening dilemma in, in Western Washington because we are so wet for the majority of the year with regular rainfall, we get to summer and we have an absolute Mediterranean climate. So uh, everybody don't move here, don't tell anybody, but uh, we have very nice summers, you know, warm, uh, dry. Uh, we had a little bit wetter June this year, but typically from June to mid-September, we do not get a lot of rainfall. So. When we talk drought tolerance in our local area, you know, we have to be real careful. I'm looking for something that will withstand the regular rainfall, you know, fall, winter, spring. Once we get to summer, maybe something that can fend for itself a little bit with uh, very infrequent uh, irrigation. So we'll start with that. Um, I want to reiterate, I'm going to say this at the end again, you know, drought tolerant does not mean that we plant something that's drought tolerant, walk away and never apply any water. It's a tough thing to tell you, but whatever you take home, you could buy the most drought tolerant plant that could ever existed. And I have to plant it, I have to water it. Once it's established, then I've got a happy plant that I don't have to water much. So, you know, as a general rule, depending on your soil and what you choose, you know, typically say you went home today and planted a nice drought tolerant addition to your garden. Um, if it's out in sun, it'll need a little bit more attention and shade a little bit less but we certainly would want to watch the irrigation on that this summer, a little bit less next summer. And then yes, two, three years go by and a lot of these plants we can walk away to some extent. So um, drought tolerant to me means that I have two, three, maybe four weeks of drought tolerance in the summertime here in Western Washington. If I have an established lavender, let's say in my garden and I have rain takes care of it all year until we get to summer, I should not have to go out and irrigate that lavender much once it's established. It might be once every two, three, even four weeks, depending on your soil. So you will have to water less. The plant will be happier when it's kept dry, but I just want to make sure everybody understands we're not going to take a lavender home today, plant it out in full sun on our slope and walk away and think, well, why did it die in two weeks? Well, we have to get it watered to get it established, okay? Um, landscape locations that I would be thinking about, um, like I just mentioned, hot, dry spots, um, slopes are a huge one with me. Um, you know, it's a tough area to plant a slope, especially if you want to walk away from it. So typically I try to tell people, take care of your slopes in the fall. You know, we've got rain starting at some point. If I plan in September, I've still got warm soil, like an excellent root development. My drought tolerant plant will establish over the winter and I will be that much more ahead of the game as we get to next summertime. So just kind of keep in mind um, different areas like that. Speaking for me, you know, I've got an old 50s house right here in Everett. I have four foot eaves around my house. So it doesn't matter if it's June or December, I got zero rainfall that gets underneath my eaves and I don't want to just leave a blank slate around my entire house I want plants in there. It's really tough to remember to water in the winter, you know, when it's raining outside every day. Oh, wait a minute, I gotta go water underneath my eaves. So I select a lot of plants for A, shade, and B, that are drought tolerant, that I don't have to go out and water more than once a month, you know, say over the winter time. So um, keep in mind problem spots. 
I would also kind of look at those back corners. You know, everybody's hose gets only so far in their yard. Maybe there's a back corner in the shade or the sun that you just can't get to as much with the hose to, to get it established. So again, look at doing those things in the fall so we have that winter to get them established and we're ready to go for, for 2021, okay? Um, I wanna mention organic fertilizers. Um, you know, happy plant is always gonna be a healthy plant. So if we start with fertilizer, using a, a good brand like EB Stone, Sure Start, any type of maintenance fertilizer, rose and flower, roadie food, depending on your plant, I'm going to develop a healthier root system. I'm going to have a nicer plant down the road and one that is more drought tolerant because it's been fed properly. So always use a good organic fertilizer in particular because now we add in root system and soil microbes. So we have happier soil, we've got happier plant. Um, soil is always the key. I could be teaching 80 different classes today and it would be the same thing. If you've got bad soil, you're going to have bad plants. So we always want to amend uh, with compost. We want ha happy soil and drainage. You know, if you live in Western Washington, you're probably smiling like, yep, I got the clay. Yep, I got glacial till, whatever the soil situation is. A lot of these drought tolerant plants need good drainage. So it's not that, you know, we can just, oh, we'll plant it there. I always have wet boggy soil, it'll be great. No, it will not be great. We need to find something that drains well during those eight or nine rainy months. And then the three that we have no rain come down, then we've got happy plants in the landscape that we don't have to water very much, okay? Um, always utilize mulch. You know, I'm a compost guy. You could be bark person, it really doesn't matter. Um, but when I mulch my garden or new plantings or slopes or any situation, I am conserving moisture. You know, and I'm talking a good two, three inches of compost. I did that on my yard again this spring. I have not had to water much at all, and I've still got happy plants all the way here to the first part of August. So, yes, I water my lawn because I'm the OCD green lawn guy, but uh, the, the planting beds can fend for themselves a little bit longer when we use good mulch. I always mention when we're talking about mulch, be real careful with bark. You know, compost is probably twice the amount of money to purchase uh, than bark is, and I'm not saying one, you know, compost is better if you ask me, but both work great. The issue with bark is it's still woody and as that decomposes over time, it turns into compost. It's still gonna add to your soil and, and keep your plants um, happy. The difference with bark is I would always put down some good fertilizer underneath it so that we don't have yellowing, struggling plants. So I, maybe you get organic lawn food or just a general all-purpose organic fertilizer, sprinkle that over your bed and then put the bark down on top of it and then we'll have little happier plants as that bark starts to decompose, okay? Um, you know, basins for new plants. This is a hard one to kind of describe, but let, let's just say we, we take a plant home that we're going to plant and it's in a sunny spot or a shady area and we want to get it, uh, give it a good chance to get going. You know, you're, as I mentioned, you can't just walk away. We have to water that little guy or little gal to get him going so that we've got um, long-term establishment. So if I plant a plant, I'm always going to have a basin around it. So I might make a little rim, a little moat with my mulch or my compost that will focus that water. It's almost like making a well where I can just sit there and really soak that new plant in, get all the water down deep. If I, if I water less often and deeper, I'm going to have a deeper root system. And again, I'm going to have something more drought tolerant. It's a little harder on slopes. You know, if I'm on a perpendicular slope, I don't want my plants sitting like that. I want them sitting perpendicular to the sky. So you're gonna have to dig out a little bit more of a well and have an area when you run a sprinkler or hand water that that water can collect around that new ground cover or juniper or whatever it is and make sure we get that plant well watered so, so it gets established here this summer, okay? Um, always water wisely, you know, hand, hand watering, sprinkler system. You know, if you're blessed with the sprinkler system that you use up here for a few months when it is dry, you know, I get asked every day, you know, how long should I run it? What should I do? When should it be on? Those are questions you have to answer for yourself a little bit by trial and error, but I would always recommend that you run it less often for a longer time. We, again, we want that water to soak down into the soil deeply. You know, I kind of jokingly call it, I'm blessing my plants around here. I walk around and give everything a quick little surface sprinkle. I look at the ground, the compost looks wet, the plant looks great but I've just watered an inch or two of soil. I wanna get that water way down into the soil structure so I get deep root system 
And again, I've got something that will establish down the road. So always try, if you've got a sprinkler system, you know, and you're running it every day for five minutes, why don't you try every two or three days for 10 minutes, you know, or even twice a week for 15 minutes. I think you'll have just as happy planting beds uh, versus, versus doing it every day. Um, lawn is a different issue. So if you're gonna keep your lawn green, it, grass will need a little bit more water than typical planting beds will. So that's a different issue for your grass zones, but planting beds, um, try to run them less often for a little bit longer period of time, okay? Um, again, what I mentioned to consider kind of for fall, um, I would really look at slopes. We have a lot of people that wanna, you know, keep the weeds down, you know, suppress erosion control, different areas in their yard, whether it's sun or shade. Um, try to get those areas done in the fall because um, it's gonna be hard to water that regularly here, here this last month, six weeks of heat in the summer. But if I can wait till mid-September, temperatures cool down a little bit, you've got that marine flow coming in and boom, I get some regular rainfall here and there, those plants will do great. A lot of roots, root development and I will be way ahead for next summer versus waiting till after the winter to do the same project, okay? Um, always watch long-term watering needs. I mean, like as I mentioned before, you know, drought tolerant does not mean plant it and walk away for all eternity. It means that we're selecting something I don't have to apply as much water to long term. I can be gone for two weeks. You know, I'm leaving for a vacation here for a couple of weeks. Um, in one more week, I'll be gone for two. And I, I want to be able to go up to the North Cascades and pitch my tent for a week and not have to worry about my yard getting torched. My grass may suffer a little bit, but the planting beds will still be fresh and crisp when I get home and I won't lose any plants because I've mulched properly and, I, and I've watered well before I leave, okay? Um, that's a lot of information, you know, kind of some general tips for you. I hope everybody was able to access the uh, drought tolerant handout. That's kind of all listed on there for you on the first page. Uh, we're gonna get into the second page here um, and talk about some plants. Um, certainly we'll, we'll cover some natives. I want to spend a little time on natives and then we'll talk about some things for sun, for shade. Um, we don't have everything around right now. Some things we'll talk about were spring plants, fall plants, summer plants. Um, there's certainly some things on that list that you may look up online and find some information about. Um, certainly write them in your gardening book and say, ooh, that sounds like a good one. I might come back next spring to take a look at adding one of those to my garden as well, okay? So if we start with natives, you know, this one always kind of makes me chuckle because if, if, if you've got a native, you know that it already likes being in our climate anyway. So it's already been acclimated. Um, it does well here. You know, we'll, we'll show you some shade and some sun ones here in a minute, but I've got a plant that belongs in the Pacific Northwest, Western Washington. A native is real easy. The one kind of twist to that conversation, if you've heard the term native are, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting proposition in our business um, where I take a native plant and I do cultivars of it. I change the foliage color, the flower color, the berries, the growth habit, disease resistance. There's a lot of different ways uh, to tweak natives. I will leave that up to you to decide if that cultivar is still native or not, because uh, I will certainly show some native ours here as well as, as true natives. But the point is, it's the same genus plant, it's the same species, it still likes the same conditions. And just because we have a cultivar of Oregon grape, you know, as example, it will still do very, very well in our climate and something that will take the same dry, the same soil conditions that the native species would, okay? So if we look at some natives, uh, let's start with a couple of suns. I'm gonna duck in and out here as I grab plants because as usual, I brought too many. So if we look at some things for sun, you know, if we start with low, we've got something here like Kinnikinick. You know, that's not one we're gonna make a spell. It's got way too many I's, C's, K's, and N's. So you can look up Kinnikinick if you wanna spell that. It's a long one. Uh, Kinnikinick is in the Arctostophilus family. So this is a, a, a native plant uh, in hotter, drier areas of Washington. It makes a great ground cover. This is one, if I had a sunny slope and I wanted erosion control, something to keep the weeds down a bit, and I don't want to water it a lot, Kinnikinick would be probably at the top of the list for something I can grow. So hot, dry, extremely hardy, and easy to grow. You can see a little bit of the red bark. Um, I don't have manzanita, I didn't bring one over, but it's the same idea if we talk about manzanita. If we're out towards the coast a little bit more, especially down into Oregon, in Northern California here on the West Coast, we would see a lot of manzanita. 
you know, if you've got an established manzanita, you would walk away from it in the summertime. You know, it has plenty of irrigation the, most of the year. And if I've got well-drained soil, that plant is going to be happy. Uh, be careful with manzanita a little bit with hardiness. Um, if you're up in the hills here in our state, um, most manzanitas are down right around zone seven, which is kind of that, you know, 10, 20 degrees above zero. We get a cold winter. I know mine and my yard has gotten nipped a couple times on my bank on a colder winter, but comes right back in the spring and, and off we go. Okay, so Kinnikinix one. Uh, I use these a lot on my house in Everett faces due south and my entire front of my property is a 45 degree bank that has no escape from heat and I don't want to water it a lot. So over the years, I've established a bunch of these little Luisias. Uh, this is a native uh, kind of mountain dry slope flower to Washington. You'd see these up hiking in the North Cascades, different areas up here. Lots of color options. You can see this one's kind of pink with a little striping on it. Uh, I've got orangey ones. I've got pinky ones. I've got little miniature ones that have purple flowers. There's a lot of good cultivars of different Louisias if you want a nice little tight succulent type plant that I can use for hot sun and not have to water much at all. Uh, here's a couple uh, shrubs here. You can see this has got some nice dark foliage, a little cut leaf. This is black lace elderberry. Now, I would never find this native in Washington State, but we do find elderberries. Oh, it's hiding me. We do elderberries in our state as a native. Black lace uh, would be an example of the nativar. I've got something that's woody, nice sized. I've seen black lace um, growing as even a small tree, you know, something up there in the 8, 10, 12 foot range as it gets, it's, as it gets older. Easy to prune, uh, does get a really nice flower in the springtime, but it does have fabulous foliage. You know, it's that dark leaf I can use out in full sun garden and again, not have to water it much for a nice tall shrub or um, even small tree look to it. If you can see the green on this little guy. So this is a, 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 another tall evergreen type native we call California wax myr myrtle. Um, that's a plant, um, you know, I, I volunteer to run our arboretum down in Everett and you could come down and visit our native plant walk. We've got a beautiful, a uh, couple of beautiful specimens of California wax myrtle. Great one for the birds with the little berries on it in the fall. But something, again, I can plant once I get it established. I've got a nice evergreen I could even use for hedging or a little taller evergreen plant. It can be pruned easily. Um, it's something that's a great filler plant if you want to kind of stick on the drought tolerant um, native side. Okay. This is kind of a fun one here. You can see the little pine needles on this guy. So we have shore pine. Um, in our state, you know, that lives all over here on the coastlines, um, all the way up and down the coast into British Columbia. Um, we certainly can do regular shore pine if you want a little taller plant, but this is another great example of that nativar where I've got a spawns dwarf shore pine. So this one almost looks like I've, I've bonsai it a little bit um, and something I can have in a hot, dry spot in my yard, even in a container. Um, and something I don't have to water much. We struggle sometimes, or nurseries do, because the staff waters these too much in pots. So if we leave these alone um, and keep them on the dry side, a lot of the pines in general, but in, in native specific, a lot of the shore pines um, take care of themselves. You know, something very, very easy to do. I, I brought up one of this. This is one of my favorite natives and it, I hope you can see the, the colors on the foliage. We've got nice red tips on the new leaves. Um, this is evergreen huckleberry. This is a plant to me, sun, shade, almost anywhere in between. Certainly if we're in a little bit more shade, probably even a little bit more drought tolerant, but this is something, again, if you're out hiking, uh, camping, you would see these all over the native areas around here. Great berries to eat on them as well. These are the ones that get the little small blue blackberries on them. If you like the local uh, huckleberry slump dessert at Anthony's, that's where I get mine every time. Uh, this is a great little plant to use, and I think towards the top of drought tolerance, if we plant some, some uh, evergreen huckleberry, very, very easy uh, to grow in a numerous spots in our yard, um, and, and one we don't have to water a lot long term either. If we need something just a little bit bigger, 
can see that kind of off the ground a little bit growing like a tree. This has got lacy foliage. This is a plant called sumac. So if we were on the other side of the mountains uh, here in Washington, um, over in eastern Washington, over into Idaho, eastern Oregon, we would find um, different forms of sumac growing native. They love heat, they love the dry. Again, something that we can plant as a larger shrub or even a tree, depending on the one we choose, uh, we can have that growing as a pretty nice sized specimen in our yard uh, for somewhere we, again, don't have to water much at all. The one I brought up um, is a native R again. Uh, we do get our native staghorn sumac in in the fall, but our, the one we're doing right now is tiger eye. So that is from Bailey Nursery. If you look up online, tiger eye sumac, it's got great foliage color. The fall color is unbelievable. And we also get a beautiful flower kind of seed head uh, in the fall as well. So I, I think a very, very useful plant. Uh, one more for sun. You can see the dark leaves on that. I have one of these in my place on my south bank. Uh, this is what we call nine bark. Uh, nine bark is more of an east native again. Uh, we call it physocarpus, but there is a lot of options for nine bark. That is a very highly uh, cultivated plant these days in, in the nursery industry where I could almost pick any kind of foliage color I like. Do I want green? Do I want yellow? Do I want something dark burgundy, red? orangey. Um, you can really play off some of those colors in your landscape and that is a great tall shrub. Uh, mine's about eight feet by eight feet. Gives me nice privacy on the front bank where I've got south. I haven't even watered it once yet this year and it is happy as can be. Really cool peely bark, you know, almost like a paper bark maple in the winter time and it does get a very nice flower uh, back in May, June as well. Kind of a little buttonhead flower on, on that particular plant. So so again, a good example of a native R, not strictly native, but something that's very, very good for, for drought as we, as we look in our yard. A uh, couple things native for shade. Um, if you can see, this one's got too many names to it, but we call it Lukotha way around here. You'll see that on the list. Um, I've heard it called Fetter Bush. I've heard it, the really funny one to me is Dog Hobble. I'm not sure where that name came from, but it's got quite a few different names. Uh, the biggest thing with Lakota Way, or what we call Coast Lakota Way here in Washington, is again, something we would find out, you know, native, native species out along the coast in different areas. But man has kind of bred this into some really nice foliage colors. You can see this is, gets a little bit of the red right now. This will turn purple over the winter, but not drop its leaves. They get kind of a, if you look at the shape of that, you know, they get kind of a bushy, moundy habit. They're easy to prune. And there's lots of options for Lakota way. This, this is one from Monrovia called Rejoice. If I like more of the purple tones, uh, one of our best sellers is one called Scarletta. If I like the real red color in the fall over the winter, and we also get variegated Lakota way. If you want a little bright, you know, yellows, whites mixed with greens and a little bit of color on your plant, um, the variegated Lakota way does very well as well. But that would be a great one, you know, whether I have shade or even part sun. Uh, I've seen it actually growing almost in full sun too, but um, I, th I think best in the part sun, part shade location if, you, if you're looking for one in your yard. A uh, couple... <coughs> I wanted to show a couple Oregon grapes. Um, obviously this is a, a widespread native around here. Um, I think these are one of the better choices we can use for dry shade. Um, we can get regular Oregon grape if I want something a little shrubbier, you know, maybe up into the three, four foot range, some of them even a little taller. Um, these are two that are a little bit more manageable for size and even can be used as ground covers or erosion control. This is Mahonia nervosa, kind of sounds like a mental problem, but it's not. Mahonia nervosa is, the, is one of the creeping type Oregon grapes, or we call it leather leaf Mahonia. Uh, the coolest thing, well, there's one. This is uh, the other species called Mahonia repens, or creeping Oregon grape. So maybe I get about a foot tall or so, and it establishes and naturalizes very well. Um, again, I like Mahonia's. Uh, because the hummingbirds do. This is a plant um, in our garden up here that blooms at some point over the winter, depending on what species we choose. We've got some hybrids that bloom in November, December, other ones that go into February, even early March. 
but it's probably the best plant you could pop in your yard. A, it's great drought tolerant, but B, the hummingbirds will thank you for having a natural nectar source they can, they can utilize over the winter months. So uh, very, very easy. Plus, we do get little Oregon grapes on there. You know, they do get the fruit. Um, it's not poisonous. It's not extremely tasty. Some people like it, but, uh, but it's certainly something, again, the wildlife will, will appreciate you having in your yard. So, so take a look at some of the Mahonias, uh, particularly these two native ones, would be uh, useful additions for drought as well. So there's, there's a few natives for you to consider. Let's see how we're doing for time. We've got plenty. Um, I think what we'll do next is, is maybe talk um, a little bit about shade, some shade options that we could use for drought tolerant. Um, I brought quite a few up here and we'll start showing you a couple. Uh, this, is a, this is a plant called Epimedium. Uh, maybe some of you have this in your yard. Um, I have quite a few in different spots in my yard. Um, I think this is one of the nicest plants for that dry shade. I mentioned eaves at my house, back corners where we don't get a lot of sun. And I want to plant something that's going to keep weeds down, spread very slowly into nice clumps, um, and certainly, you know, take up some space if you want it to. Epimedium is unbeatable. This is an evergreen plant. You can see the, the very cool new growth color. Uh, these bloom yellow, pinks, depending on the species you choose. You can get almost any color flower that pops up late winter. So these would bloom in that mid-February time frame in Washington um, and have the foliage on them still. If you want my trick, I usually let mine go about every three years. I'll go out in the winter and lay my hedge clippers on the ground and take them all the way down to the soil, okay? Then all the flowers come up, I get to enjoy all the bloom because sometimes they're lost in old plants and then I get brand new foliage and I got a brand new plant to start over again. So very, very easy to grow and an easy one to maintain for those shady spots as the epimediums. <laughs> uh, hookeras, if you were at the class yesterday, yes, I have hookeraitis and I had talked to everyone into trying hookeras. Uh, this is a, a great one called Green Spice for Shade. I probably got 15 of these back underneath uh, an old dogwood tree in my yard up against an arborvitae hedge. And if you know arborvitae, a lot of surface root, a lot of dry soil, and an area that I don't water very much. And they thrive back there. Hookera, surprisingly, are extremely drought tolerant. You've got a lot of options for shade ones like this or for sun locations as well. Uh, towards the top, towards the top of the list for, for shade is going to be hellebores. You can see right now no bloom on these. these. These We call these Christmas rose or Lenten rose. These will typically flower starting at Christmas, January, February, March, April, kind of off depending on your variety. Um, very long lasting blooms over the cold of the winter time. Uh, there's a couple here with nice foliage. You can see I think this one, is that snow fever? This is snow fever with variegated leaves. And then these are some of the new um, pennies pink, peepas purple. A lot of the new varieties have that nice mottled foliage as well. So this is an evergreen perennial. I'm not gonna watch this melt in the fall like typical perennials do. I'm going to have a clump of evergreen foliage which is attractive all the way through the season. Um, I let mine start over once a year. I always get to Christmas time in my yard and I'm like, okay, time for the hellebores to get cut back. And I go in and literally cut all of the leaves from the year before out of the plant, put them in the yard waste and let them start over again. A, I see the flowers much better as the clumps come out, um, but I can also let, get, the, get the, the, the foliage to start over again. The one complaint I hear from a lot of gardeners on hellebores is I've got big thick leaves and if I was an aphid, or a little sucking insect, this is what I'd want to hang out for the winter time. Stick right underneath here for the winter, get my sugar, eat my dinner, and I'll see you next spring. So that's why I've never had to spray mine. I just pick some point in the winter time, walk out, cut the old leaves off, compost them, brand new leaves. I don't have the bugs left coming, coming out of the winter time. So think about hellebores, um, very useful plant, lots of options for colors, for foliage. Um, short little clumping plants, you know, foot, foot and a half tall, two, maybe three feet wide on old ones. They're easy to divide. Uh, very, very easy one to grow, okay? Yesterday we showed a hosta, and I got to show him again today because 
this one kind of surprises some people, you know, big, thick, kind of luscious, a little bit on the tropical side foliage, you would think this plant needs a lot of water. It does not. Pasta is a great drought tolerant option. Um, I use a lot, again, the back of the garden, taller ones in my yard that I don't water much in shade or parts on. Um, and certainly a lot of options for foliage color. This is a yellow, limey green one called Paul's Glory. Um, but at Sunnyside here, you know, in the typical springtime, we would have about 30 varieties of hosta for sale. And you've got every color in the rainbow. You could, you could pick whatever catches your eye kind of thing, okay? Uh, Liriope or Liriope, you can see that one a few different ways. Um, you can see some flowers coming out on that right now. It blooms in the summer. This has got kind of a grassy, clumpy growth habit. Um, this is a plant a lot of parts of the country use, even the southeast uh, and the east coast a little bit. Um, but certainly something I can throw in kind of as an evergreen perennial again, something kind of grass-like that does get a nice flower on it that I don't have to water much. You know, this is one I, I see people use again on slopes, little border areas where they can plant little patches of the clumps and have a very attractive little plant that they don't have to water much, okay? That's liriope. Uh, saxifrage, you know, lots of options. That almost looks a little bit succulent seed me, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But, but saxifrage is another great drought tolerant option. Um, this one's got variegated yellow leaves. We've got some, lots of options you'll find out there at the nursery uh, for different types of saxifrage. Uh, another one that's kind of surprisingly uh, drought tolerant is Burginia. You know, this is kind of an old school plant. Reminds me of my grandmother who passed away years ago, but every summer I'd be down weeding her one quarter mile driveway with a huge bank of Virginia in the shade. And I always thought, gosh, she's never down here watering. How does this survive every year? And it just thrived in this real dry, shady rockery along her driveway. But that's Virginia. You know, it gets plenty of rain here the rest of the year. Blooms coming out of winter. You know, hot pink flowers usually. Turns a little red in the wintertime for foliage, but I keep my leaves have some nice color and I've got something I don't have to water much. Uh, this is a plant I have in my yard and I think a lot of gardeners who do shade uh, have this one. This is kind of like the Kinnikinnik. We won't make you spell it. This is Sarca coca. If you want to call it sweet box, that seems to be a little, more, little easier to say for most people. But Sarca coca uh, is a plant that loves dry shade. You know, I've got these you know, 20 years old and I have not pruned them. They might be a foot and a half tall, three feet wide. It's a plant that I, I have underneath my dry eaves. I mentioned at my own house because I just don't remember to water them very much. You know, if I can get out there and get them once a month, they're happy as can be. Uh, the coolest thing about Sarcococa, A, they're evergreen and B, this is a plant you won't see the flower. If we look real close on here, I already can see my flower buds on the tips. This is a plant that buds out in the summertime, holds its buds all the way through fall, and I will open my door in January, February, March, and my entire yard uh, smells like sweet vanilla. This is a great fragrant plant that thrives with dry shade or dry parts on uh, that I'm gonna always have reliable winter bloom and excellent fragrance from, okay? This is the low one, what I mentioned, sweet box or Sarcococca humulus. If you've got other options with this species of plant, we would also have Sarcococca confusa, which is kind of a medium one. If you can see my legs, I'd be going about two to three feet tall if I wanted something just a little taller. Or we also would do Sarcococca russifolia if I wanted something maybe as tall as me. You know, I'm 6'3", and typically Sarcococca russifolia is gonna be in that five to six foot range if I wanted a little larger plant maybe to use at the back of the dry shade garden, okay? Uh, last one for shade here, <coughs> you know, excuse me, we talked a little bit about Mahonias or native Mahonias as some of our native options, but this is a great example of another native R. So these are crossed with different species from China, from Oregon grape. Uh, this is one called Soft Caress. If you've had Oregon grape, you know they sometimes call it holly leafed grape. It's got kind of a holly spiny foliage. This one's very soft, got great texture to it. I've used this in a container before and in the garden as well. Uh, this is still Mahonia, still takes dry. This plant, this particular one doesn't get super huge, maybe two or three feet, 
but this would bloom out with the same really high nectar source yellow flowers for the hummingbirds over the winter here. This particular one would cover my hummingbirds more in that mid-November through December time frame as far as bloom. This is one of the first ones to bloom in the winter if you're looking to keep the hummingbirds happy. Then we have a big, this one's a little pokey, if you can see that one. So this is a much taller one. This is in a bigger pot. You can see a five gallon. Uh, this is another hybrid Mahonia called Charity. You'll see quite a few different uh, cultivars or native R's of these around. Charity, Winter Sun, uh, Lionel de Fortescue. I've seen quite a few different options for these around our gardens. But this is a bigger plant. You know, we, we have these down at the Arboretum I mentioned in Everett. We've got a, we've got a beautiful specimen down in more sun in our garden. These can do sun or a little bit more sun than you think. That's up there about eight feet tall. You know, if I want a, a big background type Mahonia in a dry shady corner, this would be a great choice if I want something eight, maybe even 10 or 12 feet down the road and just as wide if I don't prune it. So a much larger plant that I can almost get a small tree kind of structure to it, but something again that I don't have to water. These particular ones, same exact yellow, great yellow flower with the high nectar for hummingbirds, but this one would get me into that December into January time frame. It depends on how the weather goes up here, but this is another one that would bloom over the winter, okay? So there's quite a bit of shade. Let's see what time it is. We'll do, we'll do a few sun here for a minute. Um, you know, like I mentioned at my house, dry shade's a tough one because you think shade, you think lack of water. Um, you know, again, try to give those guys a little bit of extra irrigation to get them going. And then down the road, you can be like me and essentially walk away from some of them in, in the shady areas. I'm going to pull this card in here. So if I show you a few um, sun, sun items here, um, I'm going to start. with one of those bad words, because I usually say the word juniper to most people and I hear the, ooh, uh, I had that at my house in 1980. I would never plant a juniper again. You know, juniper has gotten a bad name over the years in the nursery industry. It is not a bad plant. We haven't sold those old rat nest tam junipers for years. That's what everyone got tired of that everybody planted in the 70s to mid 80s. Um, juniper is extremely useful for drought tolerance, lack of water, slopes, they're easy, easy plants to grow. I just think you need to find one that catches your eye. I brought, we, we carry a number of different ones for, for different heights and situations, but you know, that's a very attractive little, little conifer. This is uh, Montana mountain juniper, uh, one of the junipers communis. This is a plant I could put out on a dry slope. It would keep the weeds down and I would never have to water this long-term. So again, if I've got areas like that, Make your life easy. It doesn't have to be the big old arching old school juniper that takes up half the room and it's all brown underneath. This is a flat ground cover. You know, would keep the weeds down for the most part and do a great job at retaining erosion control on something I'm only going to get six, eight inches tall and that will spread over a nice large area. Easy to prune and I, again, I don't have to water it much. So lots of options for little ground cover junipers. Or we have Maybe something a little bit taller. This is not quite like your old Tam Juniper. Uh, this is one called Sea of Gold that Monrovia introduced. It's got great yellow color, but again, something I can prune if I want to. Very easy to shear these back, but maybe I get something up in that two, two and a half foot tall range that spreads out a little bit. So if I want a little pop of some yellow foliage, maybe look at some of the some of the different cultivars of juniper. Okay. Uh, cypresses, you know, we'll go through a lot of conifers when we do this in the fall for a little evergreen conifer class. But, you know, always think of different cypresses. This is a Hinoki cypress. Um, we've got a zillion different Hinoki cypress varieties, yellows, greens, white tipped blue. You can pick any color you like and every growth habit. You know, we've got Hinokis that'll grow 20 feet tall. We've got something like this cute little guy, Nana Lutea, that might just get two or three feet tall, you know, and I've got other ones. I, I call moss on a rock. I've had one in my yard over 20 years on a green one, and it might be a foot and a half, foot, foot and a half across and a foot and a half tall. So lots of options with cypress and something, again, I don't have to water much long term. 
uh, spruces. You know, again, from big, tall blue spruce, Norway spruce. You know, I'm, I didn't haul a bunch of different kinds over here, but any kind of spruce has got great tolerance. We have native Sitka spruce around here. If you want to go native, there's great, there's great dwarf Sitka spruce, little miniature ones that you can try out um, that are fun to use in the garden. This is a variety of Norwegian spruce uh, called Push. And if you can see on there, it's got beautiful little tip cones. Back in May, this had all red new needles come out on it. And this is a plant, uh, like say in Seattle, if you're familiar, the Elizabeth Midler Botanical Garden down at Shoreline, they've got a beautiful old one that might be two feet tall and it hangs down a hillside over some rocks. It's just beautiful with those tip cones and something, again, they don't have to water. Spruce is extremely drought tolerant. We'll do a couple, a couple more evergreen shrubs. Uh, this is called rock rose or cystus. You can see how nice and bushy that is. Kind of got a little silvery green cast to it. Um, rock rose thrive in dry heat. So this is a great plant, um, again, to use out in those hotter areas in your yard. There's a few number of different species available. You can certainly have something a little taller. Uh, this is the one they call Skenbergii. It's got a nice light pink flower in May and June. Stays a little bit lower in the two foot tall range, easy to prune. Um, and certainly if you've got seacoast, this is a great one again, we can use with salt water even around here. So be pretty useful little plant, the rock rose. I wish I had some big ones left. I'll show you an old one, but if you can see that, that fun little guy, uh, this is what we call Ceanothus. Um, or wild lilac, some people call it California lilac. Uh, this is a plant here that loves the hot and the dry. Uh, I lived just for a year or so down um, outside of Monterey, and this is one of the most common plants we everybody had in their yard down there uh, with the lack of regular rainfall. Um, it's native to a lot of the canyons down there in central northern California. Um, it is kind of right on the hardy line up here. Most folks do not have issues with it in the winter. It certainly wouldn't be the first plant I'd pick if I was up in the mountains, uh, but anywhere down here in town, if you've got hot, well-drained, dry areas, this is a great one for, for um, establishing in that, that kind of spot. These get some shade of blue on the flower, which is very pretty. You don't see a lot of blue options around. Uh, this would be an evergreen that would have those little spiky blue flowers, a favorite of the bees uh, back in May to June on most of them. So. Um, and look at options. There's low ones of these you can use as ground cover. There's kind of shrublet ones that don't get too tall and eat up some room. Um, this is Dark Star, which is a little darker blue. Might get up in that four foot tall range. And then we have something like Victoria, uh, which would get much larger. If I want something up eight feet by eight feet, just a massive, nice evergreen shrub, uh, some of the taller ones work quite as well too. Uh, Nandina is another good evergreen option. You can see some color on those. Uh, this is one called Burgundy Wine. Uh, you've got Gulf Stream. You've got lots of options for different types of Nandina or what we call heavenly bamboo. It's not related to bamboo at all. It doesn't spread and be invasive like bamboo does. Uh, but this is a great little evergreen. You know, a lot of the new ones, if you've, if you've had Nandina, you know, decades past, you were, you were stuck with that leggy, tall, open kind of shrub, which certainly still has a spot in the yard if you're looking for something taller. A lot of these new ones are very easy to grow and tidy. I'm gonna have something just two, three foot tall, three foot wide. I can shear it if I want to, but I've got great foliage color on a plant like that all season long, including the winter, and something I don't have to water again much once it gets established, okay? A uh, couple of deciduous plants that, that we would turn color in fall and lose our leaves. Uh, this is smoke tree. Uh, this is a purple one, a uh, dark one called Winecraft Black, but you've got old school royal purple. We've got grace. We've got a really pretty gold lime one called Golden Spirit. Um, you know, we say smoke, smoke bush, you say smoke tree, you tell it what you want it to do by pruning. I've seen smoke trees get up pretty tall if you want to let it grow. If you'd like to clip it back once a year, you can have a smoke bush. That's totally up to you. Um, but I've got great foliage color on something like that to add a little, little color in the garden. And again, a great drought tolerant type that we don't have to water much here in Western Washington. A 
we've got two little evergreens left. This is another one of those fun ones to say, you want them as. I've always wondered if it's plural, if it's plural, do you say you want them I? I think it's you want them as this is maybe, huh? That's a bad joke. But you want them as uh, is a great evergreen. Uh, lots of foliage color. I can have silver, cream, darker yellows, and I can pick a lot of different growth habits. We've got euonymus that works great as a ground cover for, uh, for, for erosion control on hot slopes. We've got, I have this in my yard at home. This is a taller one called Silver King. It might get up in the six to eight foot range that I can prune however I want to. And you've also got some nice options uh, kind of for that need a waste level. You know, Blondie is one I use on my bank with a lot of yellow in it. Uh, Gold Splash, there's a lot of good euonymuses <laughs> uh, out there to choose from if you've got good sun. And again, once you get those growing, these are ones in my yard I do not have to water now after a number of years, okay? So take a look at euonymus. And the last evergreen here is Strawberry Tree. And I grab these because they've already got their fruit started on it. This is not strawberry like we would eat. Some of the wildlife would like them, but you can see the little berries starting there. Uh, this is in the Arbutus family. So we looked at Kinnikinick earlier, Manzanita is in that same family. If you're out and about in the Northwest, you see Madrone trees, which are really hard to transplant or get growing, to be honest. Um, this would be in that same genre. So uh, this is Arbutus unido, a little different species. But this is something that would give me the look of a madrone, a little taller type arbutus that I could use as a great specimen in my yard that I don't have to water much. Um, this is the dwarf strawberry tree, which is a great example of dwarf is not maybe two or three feet tall, but dwarf strawberry tree. You know, I've seen those up in, the, in, a, in a good eight, 10, even 12 foot tall and wide range as they get older. So that's a, that's a really nice size plant that you may utilize for something a little bit bigger, okay? Check. We'll do a couple perennials here. We'll let you go. So I wanted to mention, see if I can hold three here. I wanted to mention sedums. Now, if we can see all three of those, right? One, two, a little guy in the middle and dark on the end. Um, I use a lot of sedums on my south bank. I think a lot of people, it's probably the first plant they think of when they think drought. But what I would encourage you to do is look at your options. There are some really cool sedums out on the market. Um, I can get some flat ground cover tiles that won't get much big at all. I can kind of now get intermediate ones that might just get a foot or so. And then I can also get some taller sedums if I want a little bit, little bit more height in the garden. So I picked just, this is one called Angelina. Um, it does grow everywhere, I'll warn you. I got a whole bunch of it. You can probably drive by my house and borrow a couple. But Angelina is one if I want, again, sunny slopes, banks, something to keep the weeds down. That's a great choice. A lot of these low sedums uh, out on our table, you would have every color in the rainbow if you wanted to come take a look. We've got greens, reds, grays, a lot of different options for ground cover type sedums. In the middle, uh, we love the Sun Sparkler series. You might have read uh, one of Steve's articles here a couple months back. He wrote about this new series. Uh, I've had a few of these growing for a few years in my yard now, red ones. Uh, this is Lime Twister with that beautiful variegated uh, foliage on it. Again, sedum drought tolerant, but now instead of being maybe a flat ground cover, I've got just a little bit of height to it if I want to step it up a little bit. And then we have taller ones. This is a new one uh, by Monrovia called Chocolate Fountain, if you like the real dark foliage and a little bit more of a rose colored flower. Um, you notice sedums all budding out right now. This is a plant that blooms late summer, fall. So you still got some flower power coming too. But it could be Autumn Joy. There's a number of different kind of great upright sedums if I want something to get up there 18 inches, two feet, maybe just a touch taller on some of them, okay? So a few sedums. If we look at uh, something like Euphorbia, this is uh, one called Ascot Rainbow. If you can see the colors, lots of yellows, a little pinky red, some green. There's lots of euphorbias around. Uh, this is a super drought tolerant plant. So I've got lots of options that I can add for something that stays evergreen. This will not go dormant in the winter like some other perennials will. So I'll still have some presence during the winter months. Um, euphorbias, 
get a real pretty flower depending on which species you choose. I will just warn you, they do go to seed a little bit. So if you like euphorbia plant one, you'll have a few freebies coming down the road. Um, I like to use the ones in my yard, enjoy the flower before they actually dry and start dropping seeds. I will just go in and deadhead a little bit to eliminate some of that kind of self sowing. okay? So check out euphorbias. Uh, rosemary, this is one we didn't talk about yesterday because I saved rosemary for today. Um, you know, very Mediterranean style plant. It makes me want to have some steak because I'm smelling rosemary now in my nose. But uh, rosemary is a plant that blooms coming out of winter. You get a nice blue flower um, and you've got some options for varieties. There's prostrate rosemary that would grow slow and kind of cover some area. This is a shrubbier one called Tuscan Blue. So I want just a little bit of height. But rosemary is a great little fragrant plant, nice flower, great for the bees again. Uh, another plant that I could use in a real hot, dry spot that I don't have to water much at all. I just added, I like ice plant, if you can see this little guy. So this is a yellow one. Uh, you can find these pink, red, orange, all different colors. Um, but this is hardy ice plant. So this is a little guy, very succulent like sedums. You can see how short that is. Something I can plant, again, rockeries, crevices, slopes, that I can establish night tight, nice tight patches that don't get too crazy. But this is something I'll never have to water. I just added a few more orange ones in my own yard here about a month ago. And yes, I'm watching them just like I told you to here this summer, but down the road, I won't have to water those little guys out there at all, okay? Couple that we looked at uh, yesterday, if you're joining us today, that we saw as part of the pollinator class, um, love blanket flower. This is one of my favorite little hot, dry, low guys. Uh, this is Gallardia. You'll see this native to a lot of the areas, um, Arizona, high mountain deserts. As long as I've got good drainage, uh, which I made sure I did when I planted, I've got a lot of cultivars of these in my own yard. Um, this is consistent flower, June, all the way till frost. So as long as I, you can see the little fuzz ball in the middle there, as long as I deadhead, those little seed heads off and on here, the first half of summer, I just continue to get more bud, more bloom, and this will go all the way into fall. These are, <laughs> these are very short, and as long as I don't overwater them, <coughs> excuse me, overwater them, and I've got good drainage, this is a plant that will seed itself and I'll get a little bit more every year. I've got a couple really nice patches of that going in my own landscape. And then we've got the cone flower. You know, the desert, the, the prairie gem, all kinds of options on coneflower. This is adobe orange, one of the one of the shorter sombrero type coneflowers. But I can pick any color in the rainbow, whites, pinks, uh, oranges, yellows, reds, every shade in between, whether I want a little bit taller ones or a little bit shorter one. You've got lots of really good uh, options for coneflowers that you will not have to water out in full sun. A couple others that we didn't. I talked too much about yesterday. This is a great little shrubby perennial called Artemisia. Uh, this is one called Silver Mound. We get Poe's Castle. There's a couple options. But again, that really nice kind of metallic silvery foliage. This does get a little bloom on it. But this is something, once I got this going in a container or my landscape, this would be a great little hot dry plant to enjoy. That doesn't need much care or water as well. Yeah, maybe we'll finish with Mr. Lavender, you know, the, the quintessential dry plant. If you're in Washington here, you go over to Squim, or what my friends come in from out of state, they call it Sequim, right? <laughs> but uh, Squim over on the peninsula is in that rain shadow. They don't get any rain at all over there, and that's some of the best lavender growing areas in the whole state. Um, the trick with lavender um, to me is always pruning. If I get a nice selection of English or French lavender, um, once these are bloomed out, I want to lightly shear these back below the flower stalks. I want to keep my plant low and dense and tight to the ground and keep it blooming season after season. If I shear them back, I'll go through two or three bloom cycles a season on most lavenders. If I let them go, like all plants, I'm going to want to go to seed. I'm going to kind of half shut down and I'm gonna get woody from the base. So a lot of people always ask, why is my lavender so woody? You need to get it pruned once, at least once a year, sometimes even twice. 
I would always ask you to probably prune it coming out of winter real lightly, let it flush out, do its thing and bloom through late spring, early summer, maybe one more little quick five minute clip job and then I'm good to go for the next year again. So, so think of lavender, you know, I think it's one a lot of gardeners are familiar with, a um, great drought tolerant option. It's something I can use in full sun and not have to do a whole lot of work to, okay? I think that's probably too many plants in too little time. So we can do some questions. I wanted to say um, just a couple things real quick. We'll do questions. Um, the discounts for the class. So we're, we're gonna honor the perennial discount for all the folks that joined us today. So you've got discount 20% off all perennials here through this coming Friday. Uh, hopefully we'll see you down here shopping. Um, just tell them you're at the class at the register. We hit a magic button and boom, you got your 20% off all your perennials. For this class, um, I really want to get people to, to utilize compost and mulch. So we also added a uh, buy three, get one free for both sizes of our planting compost from EB Stone Organics and also our bark mulch from Carp Carpenito Brothers. So whether you're a bark, a bark gardener or you like your compost, either way, you're going to get a great deal on buying bags or bales um, of either one where you can take it home and get some mulching done, okay? Um, I'm lucky, like I mentioned earlier, I get to go on vacation here or staycation and do some yard work and maybe golf and do a little hiking for a couple weeks. But I wanted to mention to you, uh, as we're doing these Zoom classes, I, I, we're getting a lot of positive feedback, which we appreciate. Um, in the middle of when I'm gone on August 15th, I think is a real unique opportunity for a lot of folks that are kind of staying home these days. We're going to do a living wreath class which I think is pretty fun. We've got uh, some ladies will be in here, three of them, kind of having a good time showing you how to make a living wreath um, that you'll be able to utilize in your own garden. Uh, we will set up kits, so we will have them available the week before the class and after the class, so you can come get the kit, you know, work with it as you're watching them kind of demo on, on how to do a living wreath, or if you forget, you can come down right after and still buy a kit, and then we'll have that video up on our website so you can literally turn them back on and sit and watch and work with them as you learn how to do a living wreath. I think that's a pretty, pretty, pretty fun class. Um, I would also mention I'm, I'm back uh, in a couple weeks. So the next class you'll see me for is August 29th. The last Saturday in August, we're going to be doing fabulous fall grasses. So we go from talking about blooms to plumes and we can have some fun talking about some of my favorite ornamental grasses that you can utilize in shade and sun and all kinds of heights. It's a great time to talk grasses because that's a fun uh, and a lot of times drought tolerant, frankly, plant that we can utilize in our landscape for a lot of texture, a lot of motion, and certainly for the fall. It's a great time uh, with the grass interest in the fall, okay? So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole. We'll see if we're gonna do some questions. Excellent. We've had lots of questions about uh, drought tolerant roses, like are the knockout roses or the uh, Rosa rugosas drought tolerant. Excuse me one second. Um, you know, roses do need some water. I would not say all of them need constantly. Certainly most of our hybrid roses need a little more attention, but um, knockout is probably a little bit better than most of the shrub roses um, are going to be a little bit more drought tolerant. But if, if we're talking about walking away for a week or two, fine. If we're talking about walking away for two, three, four weeks, um, I don't know that that's going to work really with any of the roses. The, the second one you mentioned, Ragosa, um, would be the route I would go myself. If I want the sturdiest rose, the most drought tolerant, disease free, um, all the rest of it. There's a lot of really good Ragosa hybrids. I know those of you local down in Everett, um, the waterfront curb plantings are planting with the planted with those down along the waterfront here in our, in our local big town. Um, those get hit with the lawnmower to get pruned. There are no maintenance. They don't get sprayed, and there's no water down there, so they fend for themselves and do great. Um, that would be the route I would go. You're not going to get drought tolerance. I, you know, knock out a little bit. Um, on those shrub roses, but I certainly would not walk away from a typical hybrid tea, floribunda, grandiflora roses. Uh, excellent. So we've got another one. There's some currants that are growing out by Highway 9 that some people yep. have noticed and wondered yep. if those are drought tolerant. 
Yeah, Kern is, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's the most drought tolerant, um, that, because again, I mentioned at the beginning, not really joking, you know, natives belong here, they like it here. So if you stick with natives, you'll be fine. Um, red flowering current, um, you know, we have a bunch of it every spring. That is certainly a good option to use in the garden. Um, I will tell you, cause I have those at my place in Clay Elm and I don't water them over there very much um, or at our family place. Um, current is one that will probably go dormant a little early. So if you're okay with it, you know, running out of gas, you know, mid late August um, and maybe turning a little yellow and going dormant to conserve itself for next year. Um, I would say the same exact thing about vine maple. You'll see I put vine maple on our list, exactly the same thing. Um, you see those up on the side of Highway 2 all over the place that don't ever get watered, you know, most of the summer. So they turn color a little bit earlier, they, you know, go dormant a little bit earlier, but still thrive long term. Can you talk about some deer resistant drought tolerant plants? <laughs> Everybody always wants to hear about deer. Um, if, if you take that list that we have on the handout, okay, um, and go through, go online to a good local reputable site, um, you know, Great Plant Picks is a great local source around here, or just Google deer, deer resistant Pacific Northwest garden plants. You can deviate that quite a bit ways. You'll come up with the list um, of things they usually do not browse. Um, they'll nibble on most, most all the natives, but not everything. And certainly, you know, if I was going to tell you a couple off the top of my head, you know, anything coniferous. We looked at pines, we looked at spruce. Those will be two of my first choices um, of something they will not mess with. Um, they tend not to clip on hellebores, you know, if you like, if you got a little bit more shady area. Um, Mahoney is usually not much to their taste. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one that, you know, again, look up some more information online. I think you'll be able to find quite a few options for that. What about uh, pet safe options? Pet safe. Well, if we look, I'm assuming we're talking, you know, dog and cat, not exotic pet, right? But, but um, if we looked again, uh, poison control, um, our local local or the humane society, any of those places have got a huge list of plants listed um, that are toxic to to most animals. Um, not a lot of the things I talked about today. Uh, produce a berry, and that's what I would worry about, is if you get a particular berry that might be attractive in one of your pets, or in my case, my five-year-old, um, that you, you know, you got to be a little more careful with that. Um, nothing that I've really talked about today stands out as being super, um, you know, toxic to pets, but I would always check, um, check online. You'll find some great information with those organizations. Excellent. Um, let's see. What about um, Russian sage? Does it have to be cut back every winter? Um, you don't have to. It kind of depends. I actually brought one, but I brought too many plants out. So there's your Russian sage. Um, I would probably ask that person what cultivar they had, um, or maybe if they're considering buying one, you know, don't buy the species if you don't want it to get so large. There's a lot of great dwarf ones now that don't get quite as big. Um, but yes, you know, as a general rule, I would always walk out coming out of winter, you know, after frost, so that mid-March, early April time frame up here, and either give them a little tidying or cut them back a bit so that I can start off the season with a little bit fuller plant. Uh, kind of on that same vein, what about hellebores? When's the best time to prune those? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, because I do it every year, I mean, I always go out in my own yard right after Christmas, you know, Christmas to New Year's, and I want all of the foliage gone. That may not be for you. I'm not saying you have to do it that way, but I mentioned about bugs, you know, maybe underneath the leaves over the winter, aphids and, and different things. If you just go out that one time a year and clip all of the leaves off and let it start over again, you've got a fresh plant every season and you'll see the flowers a lot better. You know, I, I like looking out my kitchen window, got a huge clump right there in the shade. I can see nothing but flower stalks coming out for two months and then I get brand new foliage comes out and I'm good to go for the season. You talked earlier about uh, the black lace elderberry. Would those work well in a pot? Oh, you know, anything grows in a pot, but I, I would caution you, you know, part of the drought tolerance is, is going to be a pretty extensive root system. And if we put that in a small pot, yes, for a couple of years, just fine. Larger pot, longer time frame, 
Um, long term, you'd have to have a pretty substantial container to grow that in. You know, say if I had a half, half whiskey barrel, yes, I could pop one of those in there and probably enjoy it for a decade, you know, kind of as a guess. Um, if it's a smaller pot, just probably not quite as long. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about some good companion plants for hostas? Oh, if, you, if you're going uh, dry again for hostas and you want to kind of stick with the dry shade, um, I would look at some of the saxifrages. That's what I use at my own yard. Um, kind of playing off the colors kind of depends on what type of hosta you've got. Um, I've got some blue that I add the green and the variegated, um, you know, uh, type of saxifrages too. I've got other hostas that are big, bold, yellow striped foliage that maybe I use more of the red type saxifrage. Um, there's also some great sedums you can grow in shade. Uh, we get one called Ogon that's a real bright yellow that would make a nice carpet underneath it. Um, and certainly, again, depending on the colors, I mean, hostas, if, if you've got larger growing hostas like I do, hellebores would be beautiful in front of those. If I've got shorter, you know, clumpier hostas don't get quite as big, then I'd step down and maybe look at some of the saxifrages um, and, and other options like that. Excellent. Um, I think we're about out of time. We've answered a lot of questions here. If there's any that we didn't get to, please feel free to email us here at the store, Sunnyside Nursery at msn.com. We'd be happy to continue some of these conversations with you and especially these more specific questions. Um, we're really excited that everybody seems to enjoy these online classes. It's um, great for us to hear your feedback. There's also a survey that'll pop up at the end. If you don't mind filling that out, it helps us learn how to get better moving forward. Um, thank you again. We really appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Enjoy the sun today, everyone. <laughs>